There's a pretty one, Ulysses. Hello Booktube, I'm Sean the Book Maniac. Welcome back to my channel. This is a readathon TBR that I am going to do in my own special way. The readathon is the Middle East readathon, and it is hosted by Jen of Book Syrup, wonderful booktuber, new to me. I'll put a link to her announcement video. You should definitely check out her channel in general. She's wonderful. And she is hosting this. I'll also put a link to the Twitter account she has created for this readathon in the show notes. It's from June 22nd to July 1st. I'll be having a busy reading month in June, but I really want to participate. The challenge is to try to read three books over the, what is it, a week or 10 days or something? I'm going to try. I have a stack of six, and I want to whittle it down to three, and I'm going to use my very own page 112 tag to arrive at the three that are the most interesting to me from this stack of six books. My primary, the primary way that I use readathons, and one of the things I love the best about readathons is that it gives me a chance to read my physical TBR. So these are all books that I've had sitting on my shelves for some time, and I'm going to try to read at least three of them. Let me very briefly explain page 112 tag. I read page 112 to you from three books. I don't tell you what the books are. I give you my uh, evaluation, and then I rank them in order of one, two, three. Today I'm doing six, so my evaluation will be very short, because we don't want to make this video 75 minutes long, do we? But I'm going to use it to generate the TBR. Page 112 tag was something I created based on a page 112 literary prize in France. You can look up my other... Page 112 videos for a fuller explanation. So yeah, I'm not going to tell you what they are, but I, I'll show you the books at the end, all right? For book number one, page 112 is a full paragraph that had started on the previous page and continues to the next. So I will just do from full sentence to the end of the last full sentence. Never had I felt so humiliated as I felt this time. Perhaps as a prostitute I had known so deep a humiliation that nothing really counted. When the street becomes your life, you no longer expect anything, hope for anything. But I expected something from love. With love I began to imagine that I had become a human being. When I was a prostitute I never gave anything for nothing, but always took something in return. But in love I gave my body and my soul, my mind and all the effort I could muster, freely. I never asked for anything, gave everything I had, abandoned myself totally, dropped all my weapons, lowered all my defenses, and bared my flesh. But when I was a prostitute, I protected myself, fought back at every moment, was never off guard. To protect my deeper inner self from men, I offered them only an outer shell. I kept my heart and soul and let my body play its role, its passive, inert, unfeeling role. I learned to resist by being passive, to keep myself whole by offering nothing, to live by withdrawing to a world of my own. In other words, I was telling the man he could have my body. He could have a dead body, but he would never be able to make me react or tremble or feel either pleasure or pain. I made no effort, expended no energy, gave no affection, provided no thought. I was therefore never tired or exhausted. Okay, well, that doesn't grab me. That didn't give me anything new about what it might be like to be a prostitute. Uh, pretty cliched and didn't affect me viscerally in any way, so no thank you. Book number two is a full page paragraph, but it does start and end on page 112, so let's see what this is all about. Hamza had gone into hiding at Bader's house when Ernest Bevan came to Cairo, and after what had happened now, he was annoyed not with Bader so much as with himself, since the fault was his. He should have tried harder to uncover the person that was in Bader and help him grow. Even as Bader was throwing him out, Hamza felt sympathy, love, and pain for him, feelings that rarely entered his heart. It seemed to Hamza that the way he looked at Bader and at people in general had changed. Indeed, it surely had changed, and he had surely been to some extent wrong in his grasp of human society. He had believed that people developed, but now he realized that his view had been too mechanical. His understanding of people went something like this. Society forms a common fraction, with a denominator counted in millions and a numerator counted in ones or tens. 
and society evolves by a diminution of the numerator against the denominator. Any increase in the numerator is at the expense of the denominator, and any increase in the denominator detracts from the numerator. Humanity will continue in oppression and wars until kings and numerators are swept away. The dominators are liberated, and all people are joined in the one true community. He now knew that this understanding was flawed. People are not numbers, and their wills and their feelings affect their inevitable development. They are not tens and units capable only of increasing and decreasing, making history with their movement. People are the full blossoms of life, with the finest feelings life has invented, and the most valuable emotions history has been able to add to human existence. People progress through life surrounded by a halo of their feelings, emotions, and ideas, which are sacred and which also have their own laws and presence. It was as though Hamza needed only to love, and to walk with Fazia at his side in the doki night to perceive her as the well of inundation that nourished him with new inspiration, in whose light he could see people and their depths, and see in their depths nobility and beauty, and see in Badir the seeds of humanity that he should have watered and nurtured. <laughs> no, thank you, no, 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 no. The numerator, what was it, numerator denominator thing? caught my interest for about the first half of that little spiel, but the rest of it was just Hallmark card philosophy. No, 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 no. Oh, dear. Um, let's try book number three. This is the beginning of a chapter, actually. It was Hussein Kersha who persuaded Abbas to serve with the British army, and so the young man had gone to tell El Kabir, leaving no trace of himself in the alley. Why, even his shop had been taken over by an old barber. Hussein now found himself completely unsettled and full of hostility for the alley and its inhabitants. For a long time he had expressed his disgust for the alley and tried to plan a new life for himself. However, he had never clearly conceived a course of action and consequently had never made a firm resolution to achieve his dreams. Now that the barber was gone, he found himself filled with a desperate determination to do something. It seemed insupportable to him that Abbas should have escaped from the filthy alley and that he should have remained. Finally, he decided to alter his life no matter what it cost him. One day, with his usual crude bluntness, he said to his mother, Listen to me. I have made a firm decision. I can't stand this life any more, and I see no reason why I should. His mother was used to his rudeness and his customary curses about the alley and its inhabitants. She considered him, as she did his father, to be utterly stupid, and never took his silly raving seriously. So she made no reply and merely muttered to herself, Oh God, please spare me this dreadful life. Hussein, however, his small eyes flashing and his near-black face becoming slightly paler in his anger, continued, I can't bear this life any more, and after today I'm not going to. Okay, well, that's a little better. There's a story and kind of human relationships without a whole bunch of hokey philosophy and sentimentality lathered on top. It doesn't deeply grab me, but I'm interested in the three characters that we have met in the, on this page, and the writing um, is fine. I, I'm interested in this one. Not bowled over by it, but compared to the other two, interested. Book number four. The noise from these trucks and the voices of the men carrying their contents kept us awake for days at a time. She reconciled with herself and admitted that the operation to repair her virginity had not given her the certainty she was looking for. It wasn't right that her lot would be to look for a man who would buy a small house in installments and furnish it with a fridge and a small oven from cooperatives and an iron given as a gift by impecunious friends and family. She took off all her clothes and lit her candle. She stood in front of her mirror for the first time in a long time and discovered that the mirror had rusted, like her body. She touched the small amount of flabbiness between her legs, alarmed by the thought of the rusty mirror. She ran her fingers through her hair, which had coarsened since she started neglecting it. In recent years, she bathed hastily without any additional creams or conditioners to soften the hair she had never neglected when she was Moonzeer's lover. She used to celebrate her body with long baths, fragranced with perfumes and soaps and concoctions of fresh herbs. She would linger when putting on her bra, imagining his delicate fingers on hooking the clasp. 
She thought now that the acid in her throat was the same she used to feel from her mother when she would look with hatred at her slender body and swelling chest. She thought that we created fear to make others afraid of us, only to discover that it clung to us as well and made us equally afraid. It was like the delusions of glory Sasan had dreamed of when she was arm in arm with Munzir on the streets of Aleppo. Then she saw people's fear when they met them, and she shivered. She would feel her body heat rising as they transferred their fear to her. She had tried to rid herself of this idea, and believed that she would be the mistress of Munzir's large house in Damascus. Okay, that's pretty good too. I don't love the writing, but it's fine. There's a little bit of a, a little bit of a hokey as philosophizing going on in that last bit, but it's not as overpowering as those first two, so or the second one or whatever. I'm curious about this one. And the, the first part and the relationship, so who's Munzir, and it seems to be an ex, and he was pretty f fearsome guy, uh, and they have broken up or something's happened. She's had an operation to repair her virginity, but it didn't give her the certainty she was looking for. I'm fascinated by this one. And this one is book number four. Book number five. When she married him, he was only nine years old and she was eleven. She waited patiently for him to mature. She had felt the first down of his beard, surprised the first spring of desire in his body, and seen his limbs grow out and his muscles swell up as he turned into the majestic windbag whom she soon learned to tame. She had never ceased being the favorite wife, adulated, wooed, honored, and above all, listened to and obeyed. At the end of a day, or upon his return from a lion hunt, a tournament, a bloody clash, a stormy assembly of the emirs, or, worse, a tedious work session with Nizam, Malik Shah would find peace in the arms of Turkin. He would peel off her diaphanous silk covering, snuggle up to her bare skin, play about, bellow, and tell her about his exploits and what was tiring him. The Chinese woman would throw her arms around the excited lion, cocoon him, give him a hero's welcome in the folds of her body, and hold on to him long and tight, only letting go so that she could pull him back again. He stretched himself out with all his weight, conquering, breathless, panting, submissive, and bewitched. She knew how to take him to the very limits of pleasure. Then, gently, his thin fingers would start to trace her eyebrows, her eyelashes, her lips, her earlobes, and the lines of her moist neck. The lion was subdued. He was purring, growing sluggish, smiling. Turkin's words would then flow into the hollows of his soul. She would speak of him, of herself and their children. She would tell him anecdotes, recite poems for him, whisper parables laden with teachings. He was never bored for a second in her arms, and he resolved to stay with her every evening. In his own rough, childish, and animal way, he loved her and was to love her until his last breath. She knew that he could refuse her nothing, and it was she who planned his conquests of the moment, his mistresses or provinces. In the whole empire, she had no rival other than Nizam, and in this year of 1092, she was on the verge of felling him. Was the Chinese woman exultant at this? How could she be? The moment she was alone or with Jahan, her confidant, she would cry the tears of a mother and sultana. She could curse her unjust fate, and no one thought to blame her for it. Her eldest son had been chosen by Malik Shah as his heir, and was with him on all his trips and at all his ceremonies. His father was so proud of him that he displayed him everywhere, showing him his provinces one by one, telling him of the day when he would succeed him. Gah! I featured this one in a previous tag, but I had forgotten how astounding it is. This is literary writing! <laughs> oh my god! I loved it. Now, it's a little bit overdone, the erotic romantic stuff. It's a little bit... I, I, my eyes glaze over when there's too much list making, even in highly literary prose, but I would take off a tenth of one percent for that, because this was gorgeous to read. I am completely besotted by this one. And finally, book number six. It begins with a line of dialogue that continues from the previous page. 
Hey guys, this is Sean during the editing phase, and I did double check something that I am very embarrassed that I didn't confirm before I filmed the video. Book number six is actually a Pakistani collection of short stories. Pakistan is not considered part of the Middle East. This video has gone on too long, and book number six was definitely eliminated from my top three picks, so I am deleting all of that, and if I could have found a way to make this change without you ever knowing that I didn't realize Pakistan is not considered part of the Middle East, I would have done so, but I have no shame. So, I think you all can guess what my first one is. So my first pick, I'm going to show you the my top three picks in a minute, but my first pick definitely, if it, if it wasn't quite obvious to you, was book number five. My second pick, second most favorite, was book number four, and third most favorite was book number three. So, five, four, and three. So, let me show you the books. My first pick is Samarkand by Amin Malouf, and he is a Lebanese writer who's been living in France since 1976. I just loved the prose in this, so I am definitely going to be trying this for the Middle East Readathon. It's just under 300 pages. I can do it. I can do it. I've been wanting to get to it since I first featured it in a page 112 tag, and now I'm going to get to it next month. My second choice is a novel from Syria, No Knives in the Kitchens of This City by Khalid Khalifa. Recently published in the last five years, perhaps. Oh, well, I can check that. 2016. And it is set... Oh, from the 1960 to the 2000s, I believe it might go up to the Syrian Civil War, but that I don't know. It won the International Prize for Arabic Fiction, and I'm curious to give it a try. I've had it on my shelf for quite a while. I first, it first came to my attention from Jenny of Re the Reading Envy podcast, and I've been curious about her ever since. And my third choice is a novel by Nagib Mahfouz. Midak Ali. I think I also featured this in a page 112 tag eons ago, because the page 112 was familiar to me, and this was pretty interesting. And it is just under 300 pages as well. I think it's very unrealistic that I'll read all three of them, certainly within a 7 or 10 day period. This was originally published in 1947. It looks like the translation was from 1966, perhaps. And uh, Mahfouz is in a, one of the preeminent Egyptian novelists who I've been dying to read for years and years and years. And I picked this up. It's probably not his best novel, but I will vow to myself that even if I don't like this, I will still try another one by him. He's got a trilogy or something. It's very famous. But this one sounded interesting. I think it's a little bit unrealistic that I can polish off these three, but I will try. And if they spill over into... Uh, July, then I'll just go rogue with my readathon. Okay, so now I'm going to show you all of the books in the order in which I featured them. And I'll also put that in a text at the at the end of the video. I don't like to put it in the show notes because I think it just keeping the suspense element makes it more exciting for you. So book number one, unfortunately, was the only book by a female writer. And that was one that I talked about in my script tag just a few days ago. The book was called Woman at Point Zero by Nawal El Sadawi, and I researched some stuff about her. She sounds really interesting. This page didn't grab me, and it's kind of ruthless to just dismiss a book by one page, but I've got so many books to read, people. It really works for me, so no, I don't want to read this. Book number two was City of Love and Ashes by Yusuf Idris. I think this one... I disliked the page 112 so intensely that I am going to on-haul it. Uh, who is this guy? He is also an Egyptian writer. Great figures of 20th century Arabic literature. It could just be translation, and it could also be a cultural difference where that kind of sentimentality is just uh, has a different meaning in Arabic culture that doesn't speak to me. That's fine. It didn't speak to me at all, so I don't want to read this ever. Book three was this one, the Mahfouz novel. Book four was the uh, Syrian novel, The Caliphate. And this one was my uh, most favorite of them all, Samarkand, by the Lebanese author Amin Malouf. 
This video is already far too long, but I just a quick addendum to say I wasn't comfortable having kind of booted off the island the one female writer for this Read the Middle East readathon. So I am adding two more for consideration. I'm not going to do a page 112 anything here. Just to quickly mention, I found out about a audiobook that I can listen to on Scribd, and it's about five hours long, and it is by Yasmin Al Rashidi. An Egypt, a female Egyptian writer, and the novel is called Chronicle of a Last Summer, and it's a novel that begins in Cairo in 1984 and goes through to the Arab Spring. I previewed it on audio. I liked what I heard. I just listened to a few minutes, but I liked the audio narrator, so I am going to do that in addition to the three books that I've picked. As well, today, there was disturbing news from Turkey that the, the Turkish female novelist Elif Shafak is now being investigated or surveilled by the jerk dictator of that country, Erdogan, Elif Shafak. So in solidarity with her, it doesn't mean all that much for what she's going to be going through, but I picked up this novel by her, one of her most famous ones, Three Daughters of Eve. And if I bail on any of the other three books, this will be my backup. I will go d directly to this. It's it's a little bit long to try to fit in amongst all my other commitments. It's just under 400 pages long, and it's about a wealthy Turkish housewife. She's on her way to a dinner party, and she gets mugged, and the story goes from there. I don't need to know anything more than that. I have featured the opening paragraph on my book haul video that will be going up in the next week. I am intrigued to read it. So that's all I want to say. I needed more women in this Read the Middle East readathon, so I'm made some changes. So what do you think? Would you choose others? Maybe some of these will land in your Middle East readathon TBR. That would be fabulous. Any comments? You know what to do. I'm so stoked for the... I think I keep saying the wrong name. It's the Read the Middle East readathon. Let's be clear. I'm so stoked for the Read the Middle East readathon starting in a few weeks time. Thanks for watching. Thank you.